fresh meat. James Wan may currently be finding himself dealing with Aquaman and producing ghost adventures with the Conjuring series, but there was once a time where he was known as the co-creator of Saw, and the world was his oyster. Approached by project after project, there was one based on the world of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that intrigued him enough to even start developing it. So today, on what the f*** happened to this unmade horror movie, we're taking a look at James Wan's Leatherface. In the mid-2000s, there were few people in horror bigger than James Wan, so it makes sense that he would be approached to helm entries in some pretty classic horror franchises. Twisted Pictures had produced Saw and had decided to approach the rights holders to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise and make a sequel. This immediately had Juan intrigued, as he had always been a fan of the series. See, the Texas Chainsaw movies have an interesting rights history. Platinum Dunes simply paid for the rights to make the 2003 reboot and its sequel. And in return, the rights holders, Toby Hooper and Kim Henkel, would receive a small percentage. But no creative control. It's low risk, low reward. But Twisted Pictures approached Hooper and Hankel to see if they would instead partner up with them on the project. This would give them both more input on the creative decisions, but also a larger percentage of the profits. This also meant a lot more work and a lot more pressure placed on the pitch itself. Which is why Twisted approached their golden child, James Wan, about the project. Writer of both remakes of The Grudge, Steven Susko, joined forces with Juan in order to develop a story. The idea of having free reign was intriguing enough to both of them, and so they started brainstorming what their ideal Texas Chainsaw movie would look like. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to this Unmade Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. They went into it with a very simple idea. What makes Leatherface tick? Oh yes, I can already hear the groans from here. Many people have had this idea before and since. And it hasn't exactly turned out well. But maybe this time will be different? Maybe? In Susko and Juan's story, a wealthy Tankawa tribe had isolated itself from the rest of the world so they could perform their religion. That religion just happens to involve carving up human beings and eating them. To each their own, I guess. This could explain why the local authorities aren't around in this part of Texas. But there was a certain family in the tribe that took things way too far and bastardized the religion. So they were separated from the group and treated more like a pariah, with the local authorities just kind of keeping an eye on them. But where I think the story really goes off the rails is its inclusion of Native Americans. See, in wanting to discover what circumstances could possibly create the Sawyer family, Susko wanted to dive into Texas's real-life history with cannibals. But these weren't backwoods rednecks. No, there aren't any of those in Texas. <laughs> Instead, they were a Native American tribe known as the Tankawa. They practiced ritualistic cannibalism and could have been the explanation for several aspects of the Leatherface story. Whenever dealing with a new entry in an established series, it can be tough as to where to place the film. Do you give the story time to breathe and take place in present day? Susko decided that they would start their film right after Hooper and Hankel's original film left off, with Sally Hardesty escaping in the back of a pickup truck. Given the time that's passed, this obviously could not have been original star Marilyn Burns, so the idea was to recast the role with someone that looked enough like her that it didn't immediately take the audience out of the scene. You know, because who needs someone that can act? But don't get too attached, because things don't go well for our prior lead. Turns out that semi-truck from the end of the original was actually part of the tribe and is holding a bunch of human carcasses for consumption. This is when Sally is murdered with an axe. Yup, they just straight up kill her off right from the jump. I imagine that going over well with horror fans. Then there's Leatherface himself, who we'd see injured from his run-in with Sally 
only to have his home burned to the ground by the Tankawa tribe. He'd then be taken to pay for his and his family's transgressions. From here, they'd jump 37 years into the future. Leatherface has been placed in a slaughterhouse by the tribe with an abusive older couple keeping watch over him. He no longer has his mask made of human skin. Instead, it's been replaced with a cloth mask that has been screwed into his face. It's a pretty grisly sight and could really be a great look. But the whole setup feels very similar to what we saw in the beginning, so it feels pretty old hat. Eventually, we get to see Leatherface, you guessed it, break out and kill the old couple. He acts much closer to what we would eventually see in the 2022 film, a hulking brute that dispatches large groups of people in no time at all. In fact, the entire script feels very much in the same vein as the Platinum Dunes films that had come just prior. Honestly, it's kind of hard to see the reverence for the original because of how much it just feels like yet another sequel. Needless to say, the screenplay doesn't really impress. The story goes about how you would expect it, with Leatherface eventually attacking a group of young people and just absolutely terrorizing them. Again, feels very been there done that. But I guess that's what Lionsgate wanted. And while that was just the first film, the pitch was actually for a whole trilogy, not just one movie. And they each would have taken place during a different day. They even had the idea that James Wan would direct the first one, Toby Hooper would step in and direct the second one, and then they had even talked about potentially having Neil Marshall come in for the third. Wan went as far as to meet Hooper about the idea. Toby Hooper and Kim Hankel both ended up being big fans of the pitch and approved it going forward. One of Wan's more interesting ideas was the concept of Leatherface having a different mask depending on what his role was at the time. If he was cooking, he'd be dressed like a mother, with full makeup. But when he had to chase down a would-be victim, we'd have the more gritty mask that we're used to. It would allow the character to have more personality without doing something stupid like having him talk. Die! If some of what we've talked about sounds at least a little familiar, it's because Steven Susco was actually credited for the story of Texas Chainsaw 3D. Given that this is quite possibly the worst entry in the franchise, and it gives little hope that this would have been anything but a colossal failure. But it's also been said that, while he's credited, very little of his script was actually used. So try not to dismiss this just yet. Especially given that James Wan has always had quite the eye, so I'm sure it would have been the best that Texas Chainsaw Massacre has ever looked. Unfortunately, this is where things hit a snag. While Twisted Pictures wanted to go the Saw route and fund everything themselves, therefore giving complete creative freedom, it didn't quite work out that way. With Lionsgate having distribution rights, they also wanted to be more involved. And with their involvement came some mandates. First, the movie was to be 3D. Going into the third dimension was all the rage these days. Second, it was to be PG-13. Lionsgate already had a corner on the R-rated fair with Saw every October, so they wanted to be able to hit a very different market. And finally, number three, there was to be no cannibalism. That's right, they wanted a Texas Chainsaw Massacre film without any people eating. Oh, these idiots. Uh, no, they're saying boo urns, boo urns. It also came out during the meeting that not everyone at Lionsgate had even seen Toby Hooper's seminal classic. Talk about being ill-prepared for your job. Needless to say, this completely destroyed Juan and Susco's interest in the project, and they immediately dropped out. Instead, Juan would go on to direct Insidious, while Susco would write and direct Unfriended Dark Web. Lionsgate instead went with a pitch from Adam Marcus and Deborah Sullivan, and eventually we received Texas Chainsaw 3D. The less said about that film, the better. Do your thing, cuz. While we may have never gotten that James Wan Texas Chainsaw film, there is always some kind of hope. While Netflix is in the midst of creating their own set of films, that doesn't mean that James Wan won't take on the franchise in the future. Because if the world of horror has taught us anything, it's that anything can happen. 